Hello again, internet. It's me, again. Today, I'm going to be telling you a wacky weird story about something I found. So, as you may know, I've been working on the found footage iceberg. I have done tier one and tier two, which has had me watch like a whole ton of movies. And because I've been working on this, I've been getting a lot of viewer suggestions. Things I should perhaps cover someday that I have not yet covered or isn't on the iceberg and maybe should be. In looking through this and watching movies that are not on the iceberg but maybe should be, I decided at some point that what I should do is a little secret episode. Just a little episode that doesn't have anything to do with the iceberg but is a bunch of stuff that maybe should be on the iceberg but isn't. But I got very distracted when I saw the greatest movie I've ever seen in my life. Time stood still for a moment and I had to make a, a decision. A serious decision had to be made. Was I going to carry on with my original plan? Was I going to just move on and just do part three of the iceberg? Or was I going to give this my entire full attention for a couple of days of time? I watched something that blew my mind so thoroughly that I had to completely change my plans. This has never happened to me before. Wow. You can feel like this at the ripe age of 31. I cannot believe that I've seen the greatest movie that I've ever seen in my life at the age of 31. I've watched so much stuff, but for whatever reason, the thing that made me freak out the most happened just like two days ago, and I still haven't fully recovered, so I decided that I should probably just go ahead and make a video about it now, get it out of my mind so that I can go forward into the future, you know, a little bit of mental clarity so that I can complete my obligation of watching the movies for the found footage iceberg tier 3 and beyond. And I'm sure that you're uh, just sitting there in anticipation waiting to hear what movie is the greatest movie of all time. And you know, to some of you, I might say this and you'll be like, oh, I've heard of that. It's pretty cool or pretty neat, but not the greatest thing ever. And those people, unfortunately, are horrific wrong. And then there's a lot of you out there that are, are going to hear what this is and have absolutely no idea what it is. But luckily, there's a May, and May will explain to you why you have to stop what you're doing. You have to get on your computer, and you have to watch this immediately. What you do from there is your own business. Uh, I have big plans for, for this thing that I've seen, and how big and how different I'm going to think about things from now on. I have seen very few movies in my life that truly inspired me to rethink how I thought about art as a whole, and this, I'm very happy to announce, was one of those instances. This changes everything. So, without further ado, I present to you Sinritsu Kaiki World Kawasugi. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you should do a little Google search, but luckily there's a May, so I'll just explain it to you. Uh, it is directed by Koji Shiraishi, who uh, directed Noroi the Curse, and I believe the movie's called Occult. He made Sadaku vs. Kayako. He's made a lot of weird and kind of niche stuff, what I would consider to be a TV show of feature films, and it's still going today, the show that I'm currently telling you about, Sinritsu Kaiki, World Kawasugi. There are many episodes of this show, and every episode of the show is a found footage movie that is feature length. I've seen most of his movies in the past. I guess it's hard to say most because he's made a whole lot of them, but I've seen most of the notable movies. Somehow, I never heard of this at all 
all. I have never heard of this. And then somebody told me about it in a comment section was like, hey, why isn't this on the iceberg? And I, of course, am an inquisitive person. So I asked myself, hey, why isn't it on the iceberg? Can I just watch it? So I started with episode one and episode one is pretty entertaining. But I quickly learned there is one episode that is considered to be the like gold standard for this series. And I just went ahead and skipped straight to that one. And I think you can do this too. There's a lot of like context in the prior episodes and I've watched quite a bit of this show now. It has the easiest title to remember. You'll never forget it. It is episode six, the most terrifying movie in history. Uh, <laughs> a very confident title uh, for, for a uh, episode of a show. Ah! So I should probably get into explaining why this is the greatest thing I've ever seen. The most bold, the most ludicrous, and the most creative thing that I, I just I feel like I've ever seen. We're talking about something where there, the complete blatant disregard for one's inability to fulfill their own creative ideas. We're talking about a show that has no concern for its own budgetary restraints and just does whatever it wants, no matter what it costs no matter how hard it is and somehow lands everything in a way that is utterly glorious. If you want to see something that is like a spoof on found footage movies, this is it. If you want to see something that is legitimately a good found footage movie, this is also it. If you want to see something that's a good horror movie, this is also it. If you want to see something that you can point out and say, oh, that's bad, I want to laugh at that, you can do that. You can do that all day long. And if you genuinely want to see through the the like fakey kind of machinations of what it tries to do and see it for its own greatness then you can also do that everything is suddenly possible with Sinritsu Kaiki World Kawasuki <laughs> Okay, so now we can begin getting into like spoilery territory uh, slash I can explain some context to you and I do feel like explaining some things about this movie to you will only ignite the fuel inside you to go ahead and look into it. Do that. I, I feel like I have never seen something that I wanted other people to see more in my life. This has like 65 reviews on IMDb like no one seemingly has ever heard of this and yet it is glorious you must check it out immediately much has been said of the like outsider artist the the true outsider art that doesn't really belong anywhere and it's made for like literally no money whatsoever and yet it does things that no other piece of art would ever think to do or would ever even try and it does it with such heft that it cannot be ignored <laughs> So Sinritsu Kaiki World Kawasugi is a show about paranormal investigators who go around exploring Japanese urban legends and finding video evidence of them and following up on them to try to figure out the truth about them. And of course, the show goes on to invent its own truth. It invents its own continuity about these different urban legends to build to a larger narrative. So the first episode is about the like slit mouth woman and there's a lot of stuff in it that's really really creepy and scary we're more concerned with like where it goes because episode six as i said the most terrifying movie in history is actually the the apex of basically anything that this could ever really do but context i feel like is necessary i do believe that one day i'll probably sit down and do a video about every single one of these movies in linear order because I do love all of them pretty like consistently. I do think all of them are pretty good but there's one that just like blasts completely out of reality and that's the one that I really want to talk about. It's kind of like when everybody was watching Twin Peaks The Return there's that one episode uh, I want to say it's episode eight that just completely derails reality does things that are so next level that it like re invents its 
own language. So while it is necessary to like know a thing or two about what we're getting into, episode six is the one that like, if you're gonna watch one, you should watch this one because this one just reinvents it everything just completely so we have three characters the cameraman who is mostly like silent and uh, doesn't really have an awful lot of plot significance but it's important to note that he is there because things get ridiculous later on when you realize that he's been there the whole time you fall into the story so deeply that you kind of forget at times that it is a uh, found footage film so the two main characters are ishikawa a very like Gully like figure and uh, Agent Mulder is played by Jin Kudo, a guy who's completely off the rails and half of the fun is how they play off of each other. Ishikawa is, is very like straight laced by the books investigator type where Kudo is violent. <laughs> Misogynistic. So out of pocket that it is hysterical at times how out of pocket he is. His approach is always, I'm going to go into any situation with a baseball bat and I'm going to kill the fucking ghost. I'm going to beat the shit out of it. M a Fox Mulder from the X-Files with Zach Bagans and then cranked that up to like 10,000. He's extremely notable uh, personality, which becomes important later. His parents are dead. This is also important to remember. His parents are dead they were killed when he was young and he doesn't know why so he has this like driving desire to beat the shit out of his problems and he will stop at nothing to figure out what's going on he is uh, desiring truth above all else and doesn't care how he gets it so it's important to note that this like dynamic is you know it's the molder scully dynamic but just cranked up to infinity but that isn't necessarily like why we're here so there is a village up in the mountains in Japan. It is a village where you either die or go insane simply by entering it. Kudo and Ishikawa get together a group of people, a ragtag group, to go to the village to investigate what is going on in the village. We have an exorcist, we have a physicist, and we have like a pop fashion model along with the cameraman Kudo and Ishikawa. And they're all gonna go there and see what's going on. It's so straightforward and simple. They're just going there to investigate a thing. They imagine that it probably has something to do with ghosts and they think they might see a ghost. Now, if you've watched any of the prior episodes, you know with certainty that they will in fact see a ghost. They never don't see a ghost. <laughs> there are ghosts fucking everywhere in this show. You, you can't go five seconds without seeing a ghost or a demon. They go to this place and uh, they, you know, there's this promise that's made, you know, that, that if you go there, you're going to go insane or you're going to die. You imagine that like most of the people are going to either go insane or die. And you imagine to yourself that this entire hour and a half long feature film is going to be at this village where each of them, they slowly either go insane or die. And you're like, okay, I'm very on board for this. This sounds like it's going to be wild and fun. Keep that in mind because it ends up changing at some point. But anyway, we're gonna just get to the village now. Also, do you remember, is it the Sugisawa village or the uh, Inunaki village? Um, I want to say it's the Sugisawa village. <laughs> Uh, it is known to be a real thing. And so getting all these people to go there, they have to go off the beaten trail. They find a sign that warns them not to proceed. And then they proceed through it, finding a bunch of like piled up rocks, dead animals, and just like a generally abandoned village. And immediately upon getting there, things like take a turn south. There is a debate going on between the physicist and the exorcist about whether or not science or religion is responsible for 
the like manifestations of uh, the supernatural. Neither of them really have a super duper clue what's going on. And when you do find out what's going on, oh buddy, it's very wacky. But initially upon reaching the village, there are hands coming out of people. So the exorcist starts performing this ritual to get the supposed evil, the demon, the ghost, whatever it is to show itself, which it eventually does very, very quickly. And I mean super quickly. Everything goes fucking nuts. First off, the exorcist goes running off into the mountain, being chased by Kudo and the physicist character trying to track him down, leaving the fashion model with Ichikawa, and the fashion model's face begins to warp in horrific ways, leading to the belief that she very well might be possessed by something, and also the exorcist character is clearly possessed by something. They do find him uh, later on down the road. His head flies off of his body and begins attacking people with worms that are coming out of the neck. Somehow, miraculously, they all make it back to the car, not the exorcist. Again, his head has flown off of his body. When suddenly the physicist, he looks up at the sky and he sees something called Hajiri, and then he tears out his own eyes. And then we see up in the sky, and there is a giant person walking through the mountains. One might call this very strange, <laughs> very suspect. Uh, you don't see that kind of thing very often. And then miraculously, they drive away from the village, and and that's, that's that. And I know you're thinking, wow, what an episode. That must be a wild thing. Thing to watch. Well, what if I told you that that was over in the first like 30 minutes or maybe 45? It's not very long. And you look at the runtime and you kind of scrunch your eyes and you're like, what do you mean? <laughs> like, what do you mean it's not over? What the fuck could be in the rest of this episode? Well, buddy, I tell you what, it takes a fucking turn. So things begin to get completely out of control very soon, my lovelies. First off, the they get back to their little like production office and they're talking amongst themselves, Kudo and Ishikawa, about what they should do next. So they decide to set up a sting operation where they hide in a tunnel, a kidnap the ex-minister of defense to ask him what the fuck is going on in the mountains. They beat him with a baseball bat until he admits that something was going on, whether or not the government actually knows about it. Because clearly there's a sign up so the government knows not to go in that area. But why exactly not to go in that area remains to be seen. So they rush over to this old man's house. They break into his house. Then they threaten him. He uh, agrees to show them a film, a film of demon god soldiers, which are essentially giant women meant to be weapons of mass destruction. They're like kaiju people they invented during the world war because of different reasons they had to conclude working on it. But did they really conclude working on it? Who knows? So the old man then shows, shows Kudo a picture of his parents and says that these people are responsible for doing the research. So then Kudo realizes that his parents who are dead were actually the people responsible for creating the demon god soldiers that are walking around the fucking mountains and are super duper scary and apocalyptic and, and definitely a good thing to see. They make everybody go damn crazy. So they decide that they must return to the woods to confront the evil there as they are, are both cursed. This is another thing. Uh, they, they are both cursed by different like artifacts that mean that they will very likely like die. Well, we're going to die anyway. We better go put a stop to all of this. So they show up at the village and very early into the trip they find this guy called the teacher and he is someone who like is also responsible for researching and working on the demon god soldiers the loose cannon that he is kudo begins beating the shit out of him with a baseball bat for a seemingly forever amount of time he beats the ever loving fuck out of him then ishikawa uh, takes a knife and slits his throat cutting off his head and when she cuts what? off his head a 
bunch of worms come out of it, and the worms fill up the vision and become a portal into seemingly some other world, and all hell breaks loose within this portal. Kudo can't get to Ishikawa, the teacher does get to Ishikawa and cuts her head off, and then she floats around. He and the cameraman, Kudo and the cameraman, go flying through the portal and land in the past. They look up the trail and they see Kudo as a child with his parents. And in this moment, they realize Kudo's like, I can go over there and tell my parents not to research the demon god soldiers. Therefore, perhaps undoing all the damage that happens in the future. But when he goes to talk to them, they don't listen to him and they believe that they're making some kind of sacrifice for the betterment of humanity and he can't seem to talk them out of it. So he gets a knife and fucking murders his own parents. Therefore, he's the person responsible for his parents' death. And then at the very end, they agree that he should challenge his destiny because if he felt the need to kill them, he must be in the right or he must have good reasons for doing what he's doing. So then they hop back into the portal, which is now Ishikawa. Ishikawa's head uh, becomes a portal that they jump into, taking them back to the dam. Kudo looks up and sees one of the demon god soldiers walking around up there, and he decides that he has to take his curse and go fight it. So he uh, grows a massive size, has a ton of tentacles coming out of him, and he fights the demon god soldier. <laughs> Uh, nothing is ultimately accomplished by this, seemingly. Then the cameraman returns back to the production office, elaborating on what exactly happened in the story. Very difficult to piece together, uh, but also very simple. And then looks out his window. Then you see a giant uh, demon god soldier lingering above Shinjuku. And it's just like very ominously hovering there, seemingly changing the fabric of reality, making everybody accept that this is like a crazy thing that's going on and then it just ends the end it's over i have truly never seen something that had such a blatant disregard of what it could do what was possible to do with a story and also like what made narrative like the most narrative sense disregarded that altogether and did all of those things anyway no matter how they were achieved one might say that the cg in the show is not very good I would disagree entirely in the same way that I think that Twin Peaks The Return CG is world bending. It, it doesn't, it, it's like so unreal that it comes back around to being bewildering, being almost more effective that it looks and feels that way because it doesn't look even remotely anything you've ever seen in reality. A lot of times it doesn't even blend in with its own surroundings. It draws so much attention to itself that it becomes a focal point. I, I actually like love the way that this looks. This is someone who had more ideas than anyone I've ever seen in my life and yet executed all of them regardless of whether or not they thought it would confuse an audience. I personally write horror stories largely for a living like I write books and that's my big thing that I like to do and my concern when I'm writing books is almost always like does this really make sense? Would an audience member see this and be like, I don't really feel like I can follow you on that thought. Talking about what does make sense, what's practical, what's real, and what's down to earth. If this sh series showed me anything, it's that, like, who fucking cares about all of that? You should just lambast the audience with absurdity until they are utterly entertained by the absurdity. You can just do whatever you want. There really are no rules to creativity and I do think that we especially like lately when you go see a movie in the theater you know you're you're seeing something that is so lukewarm and nothing like all that interesting ever happens and and you kind of just accept scraps we have all become 
more or less victim to this idea that creativity should be limited to what is like possible and what is real. And I think that this show just challenges that. It just spits in the face of that so intensely that it, it almost sparks a new kind of creative urge. I can literally do anything at all at any point. And if it's creativity, it's fine. It's fun. That's what creativity is supposed to be. Therefore, just completely undermining everything that we've grown to believe creativity is supposed to be. Go on. What are you going to do? I don't know unlocking the true freedom of creativity. Anything goes in the world of stories, and we should probably be reaching a bit further into ourselves to be more creative than we're being. And like, whether this show is intended as a comedy or as a horror thing, it is successful as both. And it's also successful as a piece of like outsider art and absurd like fiction, successful as a bad movie. It's successful on every level simply because it decides that every aspect of creativity is welcome within it. There's an episode later, and I'll talk about this in another video someday when I do the entire series, but there's an episode later where there's somebody sitting next to a shelf of DVDs, and there's a big box set of Twin Peaks sitting on the shelf, and uh, one cannot look at that and not think like, I mean, of course, like that's one of the things that we love about Twin Peaks is that everything goes on Twin Peaks. They can do whatever they want, and that's part Partially why that show is so revered. This movie, this show, this film within this show is like the perfect example of what we should be learning from like creativity and where we should be taking our own creative spirit. We shouldn't be trying to tame it or put it in some sort of like easily digestible box. We should really be pushing ourselves outside of the boundaries of what we think is possible and making the piece of art meet us there and making the audience meet us there because that's where the fun is. That's like what's fun about creativity. And it's a shame that we don't look at it that way anymore. We should be looking at that way more. Overall, I feel like that's kind of largely what I have to say. I, I could not believe how great this was. And while I was going to do like this secret episode of the iceberg, which I still might do, I was going to include this on that iceberg. But this is like so fantastic that it just needs to go in its own like pocket universe. Like I'm doing a video about this movie, but also I'm definitely going to do a video about the whole series. So it kind of like, it doesn't make sense that I would be including it in other things. But please go watch Shinritsu Kaiki World Kawasugi. It is on YouTube. Uh, watch the whole show. Enjoy it and let it change your approach to creativity to something infinitely more fun. Because I'm tired of things being unfun creatively. I, I want to see more stuff like this and less stuff like basically anything we've had for the last year. I think that would be great. TBH. I have been May Leitz. Uh, this has been Nick Spheres, the YouTube channel. If you like what I do, you should consider subscribing and liking this video. You can also comment below if you've seen it, if you haven't, if you're, uh, if you think that it sounds cool, uh, check it out. Please check it out. Also, uh, I have a Patreon. I'm going to be doing this thing where I send out little Halloween mailers. It's going to be at the $10 tier. So anybody who supports me at the $10 level will be receiving one of these in your mailbox. So please go hit that up. And uh, uh, you can also support for as little as $1 if you wish. Uh, new copies of my books, Fluids and Girl Flesh, coming from Hear Us Scream Publishing, uh, is available in the link below. These are done, so you can pick these up now. And uh, I will see you next time, my friends. Have a lovely, safe evening, and enjoy some Senritsu Kaiku World Kawasugi. At the end of this video, you should desire. Damn it. Anyway, goodbye.